But I'm excited to dive in today to our series, conclude this series. And I had several different sermon titles and I really kind of landed on one. Uh, I've called today Pain to Purpose. Uh, if I'd have a second title, I would call it Overcoming Offense. Uh, I want to talk today about what do we do when we're offended or someone wounds us or hurts us. You know, this uh, past week uh, in the Burroughs household, my two oldest are playing basketball right now and it is basketball playoff season. So we had four games this week alone. And one of the games my oldest was playing, I'm so proud of them, the way they've been growing in their game and just their character this season. So this one particular team that they played, they were very aggressive and a lot of fouls, um, more physically aggressive than other teams. And I could tell my oldest, Hannah, was getting a little bit frustrated. So at halftime, I came up to her and I said, hey, how are you doing? And she said, she said, dad, they keep fouling me. And I said, I know, I said, I'm watching. Uh, I said, listen, but you cannot control whether the other team's gonna foul you. You can't stop a team from playing aggressive. I said, what you can control is how you respond when they foul you. Made me think of what Jesus said to his disciples and what he says to us in Luke 17, one. He says, it is impossible that no offenses should come. It is impossible that you won't be offended by a coworker this week. <laughs> it is impossible that your spouse for not to offend you. Hey, can I be real? It is impossible for someone, even in this church, to not offend you. Hey, just a reminder, we need an occasional reminder of this. Uh, church is not full of perfect people. It's full of people who are serving a perfect God. Amen. So when you get offended in church, we shouldn't be like, oh, I can't believe it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Last I checked, we're human. Right. And humans hurt humans. But listen, so offenses are going to come. Someone's going to hurt you, probably this week. And sometimes people do it unintentionally. They don't mean to hurt you. Sometimes they do. So here's the thing we have to focus on. The Bible has so much to say about it. Is how do we respond when the offenses come? How do we respond when someone says those hurtful words? When someone does mistreat us? When someone does overlook us? How do we respond in those moments? And we're going to look at a, a passage today I've actually never taught on in my our five years of, of Catalyst. Uh, it's a great and I think a beautiful story of the grace of God and the power of forgiveness. And it is a story of Hagar. Uh, Hagar was the maidservant of Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at Genesis chapter 16 today. But before we dive in, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. And God, today we just submit ourselves to your word today. And we thank you, Lord, that you have something to say to us um, about this area of overcoming offense. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let me give context, Genesis 16, real quick. So Abraham and Sarah were 75 years old when God gave them a promise that Abraham was gonna be the father of many nations. Uh, may I remind you that no matter how old you are, if you have breath in your lungs, God has a purpose for your life. In fact, you may retire from a career, but there's no retiring from God's purposes. May I even say this? I think actually in your latter years, you are actually best equipped to do the most for the kingdom of God because you have the wisdom of life behind you. So at 75 years old, God tells Abraham, hey, hey, player, I'm not done with you yet. <laughs> That's the Jeremy International Version. It sometimes throws in some hip hop idioms from the <laughs> early 90s. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, so he tells them, you're gonna be the father of many nations. And Abraham's like, God, I don't know if you've been attuned to what's happening here on earth, but I've been loving this woman for a long time okay. and there have been no babies. <laughs> and she's been barren. So they, they trust God. 
And if you've been waiting on the promises of God, just to encourage you, uh, up at this point in Genesis 16, it had been 11 years. They were 86. Let me also give you context. Sometimes you can read the Bible and think, oh, well, 75 then is not the same as 75 now. Yes, it was. They were AARP card-carrying <laughs> members, my friends. It, 75 is 75, okay? Don't be like, well, 75 was like 25 back. No, it was 75. 75. Abraham had back pain. I don't know. But at 86, um, Sarah, by the way, in this scripture, it's going to refer to Sarah as Sarai. And Abraham is Abram because that was their name then. It was changed later to Abraham and Sarah, which we most uh, of you know them that way. But at 86, Sarah's getting a little impatient. Anybody ever get impatient with God? You're like, come on now, Jesus, okay? I've been waiting here. You know how hard it is on this earth? We got smartphones now, Jesus. Come on now. Um, and so she says, Abraham, I can't have a baby. Why don't you sleep with my maidservant, Hagar? Now, if Abraham, you know, I kind of read this around, I'm like, come on now, Abraham. You had your shot to prove your love for Sarah and been like, know my love. I only have eyes for you. Listen, if you, didn't, if you didn't think the Bible was spicy, you need to read your Bible. This actually happened. This actually happened. Some of y'all watch movies for some spiciness. Y'all need to read your Bible. Sarah said, go ahead and have a side chick. And Abraham's like, should have been like, no, my love. But he was like, all right. It's like, come on, man. That was your chance, Abraham. You fumbled the ball. So he, he sleeps with, with Hagar. This is really in the Bible. Yes. And Hagar gets pregnant. First time. Yep. And the Bible says when she conceives, she begins to despise Sarah. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Yes. Because under law, this was under law, if a maidservant had a baby, that baby was now to the person who she served. So she's despising her because she's like, I now have to carry this child for nine months and give this baby to Sarah. And the Bible says that then Sarah began to mistreat her. So in Genesis 16, what happens is, is, is Hagar flees. She runs away. Because in, in, in a sense, to, she's clearly offended. And understandably. Can we just call this for what it is? It's traumatic. Like she's like, she takes advantage of Hagar, her and Abraham. And then they mistreat her even more. more. And, and she's running now away. And that's where we're going to pick up in Genesis 16, uh, verse 7. The scripture it says this. Let me give you context. She's now running away from, they were in Canaan. Most scholars presume she was going to Egypt where she was from. Hagar was Egyptian. Uh, many believe she was actually given as a servant to Abraham and Sarah from Pharaoh. So she's going back to Egypt, more than likely where her family was from. And it says this, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that's beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel said, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much. They will be too numerous to count. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with that, that promise that the angel gave her, by the way, this is the first time an angel in the Hebrew means messenger of the Lord. Um, this is the first time that a messenger from God ever appeared to anyone in the scriptures physically. This is what's called, the, in, in, in theological terms, this is a theophany. It's a physical manifestation of God. First time ever in the scriptures happens to Hagar. I love the fact that the first person that God shows up to is somebody who feels outcasted and neglected and overlooked. Don't you love our God? He didn't show up at the palace and said, where's the most powerful people? He came to the one who is powerless, the one who had no social or economic capital. And he came after Hagar and he, he meets her in this moment. And there's three things that we see that, that, that Hagar does really through the help of this messenger. 
um, that really helps her to move from being in this place of pain and offense to walking in forgiveness and seeing God's purpose of her son Ishmael come to pass. Here's the first point, the first application that we get from this is that in order for us to move from pain to purpose, we have to turn to God for healing. We have to turn to God for healing. When he asked her, where are you going? She replied, Hagar replied, I'm running from my mistress, Sarah. How many of you know when you are running from something, you will end up someplace you don't want to be? When you get in your car to go someplace, you don't put in your GPS, yes, I want to leave home. (laughs) Right? You put in where you want to go. She's running from pain. She's just trying to get away from this painful situation. Be careful if you begin to build your life running from something and not towards something. You might say, well, I'm enjoying this season of singleness but you're actually running from the pain of your ex's unfaithfulness. You might say, well, I just need a career shift, but you're running from the pain of your past toxic work environment. Or you might say, you know, we just like this kid-free life, but you're actually running from the pain of your own childhood trauma because you don't want to repeat that. Or you say, Pastor, I'm too busy to get involved in community here at church, but you're actually running from the pain from your past church. Be careful. If you live your life running from something, you will end up someplace you never want to be. Let me give you context. She, She was going from Canaan to Egypt, 480 miles in the wilderness, I did this research. Most scholars presume she would have died with Ishmael in the womb. So what she actually wanted, be careful because you you can run from something for protection, but you actually can end up thwarting your purpose because you're in this self-protective mode. So she's running from something. Bitterness and offense began to take root in her. Job 21, 25 says another, another dies in bitterness of soul, never have enjoyed anything good. An offended heart gives birth to a bitter heart. And bitterness is like a poison. I was talking to a gentleman who's, who'd worked in pest control for over 30 years. And he was laying these, uh, these kind of bait stations of, of, of mice, mouse poison uh, that we have outside of our home. And uh, while I was talking to him, I had asked him about like, you know, why do mice kind of come in? I'm always intrigued of like, when they're there, I ask them all kinds of questions. And he said, now I'm sorry for what I'm about to share with you, um, but he said, every house has mice. <laughs> 33 years he's been doing this. He said every house. He pointed every house in my neighborhood. He said every one of these houses have mice. They just maybe haven't seen them yet. Is they find places in your house because during the winter and the summer, sorry, I won't go any further. They, they, find, they find more shelter. So they come in. So fall and spring, they're outside. Winter, summer, they come in. So he said, um, so I said, well, tell me about these, these, these bait stations. Why, does, why do mice um, come and eat the poison? He said, well, it, sm- it smells like and tastes like peanut butter and chocolate. Fair enough. Come on. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't want that? <laughs> little peanut butter and Nutella. I was like, done. <laughs> and, uh, but catch this. So he said, he said, he said, um, the way the poison is designed, this was fascinating. He said, it doesn't, it doesn't kill them upon first ingestion. So usually when they come in, he said, the base station, they eat it, they ingest it. And then actually mice, the way their cheeks are formed, they store it. So they bring them to store and they bring it back and they give it to their nest. He says, he says then they come back to it because it tasted good. It felt good initially. Just like it feels good initially to be offended, doesn't it? I can't believe they did that to me. And they come back. They get another bite. They store some more. He says, it's a little while after the second ingestion, it kills them. Jesus. Hebrews 12, 15 says this, that bitterness is like a root 
that when it bears fruit, it defiles many. It's a poison. And it might feel good initially. I can't believe how my boss treated me. Can you believe they did that to me? What happens, it begins to take root and it becomes a poison that Job says brings death to your soul. In fact, the Journal of Religion and Health in 2022 found that bitterness is associated with a host of negative consequences, including increased stress, depression, anxiety, and suppression of immune system. If that's not evidence of it being a poison, I don't know what else is. So be careful. In fact, John Bevere, a Christian author, calls offense the bait of Satan. It's a bait. And it feels good upon first bite, right? I can't believe they did that to me. They're so wrong. And then it ends up eroding and eating away at our souls. So what do we do? When well, verse 11, the angel of the Lord tells Hagar that you are to name your son Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. Hagar then used another name to refer to the Lord, verse 13. She said, you are the God who sees me. That means you're a God who looks out for me. You're a God who cares for me. Hagar cried out to the Lord in distress. A few weeks ago, I picked up my children from school and I usually ask my kids when I pick them up, one of the first things is, how was your day? I love to hear about how their day went and their classes and their friends and their teachers. So one of my children, their response was, I said, how was your day? He says, fine, it's fine. I said, okay. I said, doesn't sound fine. And they said, I want to talk about it. I said, I respect that. I respect that. We get home and some moments pass and they come into the kitchen to grab a snack. And I said, hey, dad would love to hear about your day. And they end up telling me what happened. And long story short, someone in their classroom had said some hurtful things to them. And we processed that pain, that offense. And over the course of the conversation, I could almost see the distress begin to dissipate as they processed their distress. And what we see here with Hagar, as we see in this moment, is she, she cries out to the Lord in her distress. And here's what you have to be careful of, especially the longer you walk with God. I've, I found this to be true. That if we're not careful in the same way, let me say it this way. We can approach God in the posture of religion and not relationship. So we come to church to just check a box. It's the right thing to do. We read our Bible because, right, it's the right thing to do. We pray, we go through our prayer list because we, you know, my pastor said I should be doing, I should be praying. And, and we can be sometimes if we're not careful, I know I can be, like my daughter, when we talk to God. And I think God in heaven sometimes just like, how are you? Fine. He's like, oh, I don't think you're fine. In fact, I saw what happened yesterday at work. Or I saw what happened last week with your spouse. Or I actually saw what you experienced as a child when you were four years old. It doesn't seem like you're fine. In fact, I've seen your whole life. And sometimes we're not honest with God. Sometimes one of the most helpful prayers you can pray is not giving your petitions to God, but just being honest with God. Like when's the last time you were honest with God, like really honest with God? First Peter 5, 7 says this, that we can actually give our worries and cares because he cares for us. What did Hagar call God? He's the God who looks out for me. He's the God who cares for me. Harvard uh, published a study in 2021. They did a meta-analysis and they found over 200 uh, studies done that shown the, it was statistically significant benefit of a clinical treatment called expressive writing for people who had experienced trauma. There was one study in 2019 done that looked at a six week intervention of expressive writing uh, for patients who had met the criteria for clinical depression in the DSM-5. And what they did was they instructed them for these six weeks to write about their traumatic experiences, um, to process their thoughts, the details, the feelings that they experienced. 
And after six weeks, they found that for, for all the patients, there was a decrease in perceived stress, an increase of resilience. And catch this, 35% of the participants who went into the study with clinical depression no longer met the criteria for clinical depression. So they concluded that expressive writing, here, here's how they kind of summarized it. They said, when you, when you express all of the thoughts and the feelings that uh, of the trauma, of the hurt that you've experienced, there's almost a cognitive reorganizing that happens in our brains and that it actually brings healing to our souls. And I thought to myself, if writing out your feelings can be healing, how much more like Hagar, if we express our distress to the great physician? There were three things they said that should be present for you to experience the full benefit of expressing your feelings about a hurt you've experienced. There were three qualities they said to embrace. I've actually reworded the last one to include the God factor. But this is from the research. Number one, they said, don't hold back. So loosen the faucet, just let it go. And maybe this is uncomfortable for you because maybe you grew up in an environment that you weren't kind of, given the liberty to express your feelings. That's, that's a lot of people. They grew up in environments where they didn't feel like they could talk about. And here's the best way you can grow in expressing what happened to you is just to begin to express what happened to you. And what you're gonna find is this. Have you ever had like a thread on a shirt and you begin to pull it? And the next thing you know, you got like 12 feet of thread and you're like, oh, <laughs> half your sleeve's gone. <laughs> here's what you'll find if you're new to this that your emotions are very similar. You begin to pull out thread. Next thing you know, you're like, wow, I didn't know. I felt all that. I didn't know how hurtful that was when my spouse did that, or when my dad did that. You begin expressing. Number two is you fully express, this is from the research, your thoughts and feelings. They actually said this, no detail is too small, no feeling too large. Let it all out. And then lastly, the research says is, is find meaning or find revelation. Here's how I want to say it, is listen for God's voice. Because I think the one who can give the greatest revelation to the pain you've walked through is the one who knows the end from the beginning. Amen. Is the one who the Bible says he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Yes. So maybe this week for you, is, is when you go on your prayer time, before you jump into your prayer list or what you need, just, just kind of begin talking to God about what's happening on the inside of you and, and see what happens. Because we see in Hagar's life, we see in Peter and we see in the research, when we begin to express our feelings, I say this way, that uninhibited, honest prayers help to heal our soul and dig up the root of bitterness that can take root in our life. It's point one. Point two is this. So we turn to God for healing and then we find freedom and forgiveness. Verse nine, the angel tells her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. This kind of, this moment messes with me because it seems cruel, doesn't it? Like go back to the one who mistreated you, go back to the one who used you I'd be like, angel, no, okay, <laughs> not this one. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest. That's a hard one for me. But let me remind you that just because something may be painful does not mean it's not God's purpose. See, let me give you context. Hagar was traveling 480 miles in the wilderness. It was, a, it, was a, it was a path no one traveled. It was dangerous. Both the terrain, but also on that terrain would have been people who would have, who would have mugged her, who would have probably taken her life. So there is a very high likelihood, we don't know this for certain, but a very high likelihood, people know, knowing that context, that she would have died. So, so by, by telling her to go back to Abraham and Sarah, even though it was painful, it was purposeful because it was actually going to save her life and Ishmael's life. 
Hey, may I remind us that just because something feels good doesn't mean it is for your good. Because sometimes being offended and bitter feels good, but it's destroying you. And here's what I've learned. Sometimes forgiving people, can I be honest? It's painful. Anybody else? Because you're like, they don't deserve my forgiveness. <laughs> because sometimes the people that you're we're called to forgive has not, have not repented. Right? But we're called to forgive anyway. Here's what Proverbs says about offense. An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. That it's almost like we put walls around our life. In fact, I like to say it this way, that when we hold on to a fence, we build a fence around our life. I actually have a fence with me here this morning. Thank you, Rachel. The only time your pastor ever goes to Home Depot is for message props. Pray for Christina. I was very upfront when we got married. Just listen, I don't know what Home Depot is. Uh, but here's what happens when we hold on to a fence is we build a fence, the Bible says. And here's what happens is we think we build this fence. You built that fence after that last relationship because of your ex's unfaithfulness. You built it to protect you, but it's actually keeping you from the very relationship with you want because now you no longer trust men. You built a fence after that last job and you think I'm gonna protect my, no, no boss is gonna take advantage from me, but it's actually keeping you from taking a step of faith to experience the career of your dreams. Be careful because when we build a fence, we think we're protecting ourselves, but we're actually preventing ourselves from walking in the purposes that God has for us. See, we build a fence around our heart because of our childhood trauma. And what it's actually holding us back is actually the, the family of our dreams. May I remind us, as John Bevere says, that offense is the bait of Satan. And here's what I've found. I'm just gonna speak from my own personal experience in pastoring people. The enemy will often attack you and produce pain in your life in places that are actually part of God's purpose for your life. Because he sees that, listen, if, 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 if I can withhold them from stepping out in faith in that business, if I can stop them from trusting men in relationship, then I can thwart the purpose of God in their life. So what we must do is we must release a fence and tear down our fence. Yes so that we can experience the purpose that God has for us. Thank you, Rachel. So we have to release the offense. What's releasing the offense look like? Releasing offense is forgiveness. I love what Corey Tinboom says. If you know her story, she had to forgive some people. She says to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover the prisoner was you. Let that sink in. Many of us are walking around imprisoned and we wonder why I'm not walking in the full purpose that's in my heart it's because we're imprisoned by offense. And the key to unlock that prison is forgiveness. Peter said to Jesus in Matthew 18, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Now watch this, let me give you context. It was Jewish custom that you forgive someone only three times. The fourth time, you can punch them in the face. Come on. <laughs> Some of y'all wish it was the same today. Come on. Bring it back, Jesus. <laughs> Three times, grace lifted. So Peter's like showing off. He's like elbowing John. Watch this. Jesus, what about seven times? See, I'm his favorite. <laughs> and Jesus says, I don't say seven times. Seventy-seven times. Like, can you say that again, Jesus? I think you said 77. That sounds crazy. <laughs> in other words, you never stop forgiving. Yeah. My son is eight years old and in his basketball league, there are a lot of fouls, <laughs> a lot of offenses. I mean, you got kids running with the basketball like it's football. <laughs> 
Uh, ain't no two steps. It's like eight steps of the hoop. It's like, <laughs> you know, uh, it's like you, you see it's like fouls everywhere. I mean, it's a little bit of mix of like basketball, football on the court. It's kind of like eight-year-old boys just colliding. Um, and a lot of the times the refs overlook a lot because they're like, there's so much. If they caught everything, it'd be like blowing the whistle every few seconds and the games would be seven hours. <laughs> so we all just kind of watch a little bit of organized chaos. But after a while, like after your 17th travel, the ref starts calling it. Like after your like 12th time that you like swatted someone's arms and they went up for a basket, then they start calling it. It's almost like after a while, the grace lifts. And sometimes in our humanity, we can be that way with people. It's like in marriage, here's what I found. In marriage a lot of times, you have grace for your spouse in that first year or two years or three years. And also that grace lifts and you're all offended because you asked your husband to take the trash out and he didn't take the trash out <laughs> when you wanted him to take the trash out. Are you all up in arms because you told her the kind of oatmeal you like at the grocery store, but that didn't get the kind of oatmeal. And next thing you know, you're all offended because he forgot to take the trash out at 7 p.m. And he took it at 8.02, 8.02 p.m. <laughs> Come on, we've been there. And next thing you know, your blood pressure skyrocketed over trash. <laughs> Or at work. Come on. You get a new job and you're like in that grace period the first six months. Oh, it's wonderful. I love my new job. Six months in, when your coworker does not respond to your email in 24 hours, you are heated. You're like, did you get that email? You forward it back. See below. And next thing you know, you are all full of anxiety over an email. It's the bait of Satan. That's how it works. We laugh about it, but we've all been offended over an email. We've been offended over trash day. This is how the devil works is he wants you all bent out of shape. We now live in a culture where people get offended over someone they don't know because of something they put on Twitter or Instagram. They got people worked up on social media over strangers. The devil's like, man, this just keeps getting easier and easier. They don't even know each other. And you're on blood pressure medication because of Facebook. So, so pastor, but listen, we're human. So the grace will naturally lift. When he misses trash that 12th time, it's hard to keep grace. When that person, it's been, it's been now, it's been now 72 hours, no response to that email. And you forwarded three times. And they're in the cubicle next to you. Are you peeking over? Send. You hear the ding. Hey, I heard the ding. Check your email. So what do we do? Here's what, here's what Paul said in Colossians 3. He says, he says uh, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Watch this. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. If you ever have a hard time, and listen, I'm, I'm a work in progress, so don't look at me. I, I, like I've, made, I, I've been there. And he, here's what, what Paul's saying helps us whenever we find ourselves having a hard time having grace for people, is remember the grace that God has for you. That every time you had a, a mishandled word you spoke that hurt somebody, God forgave you. Every time you had a lustful thought, God forgave you. Every time you had a self-righteous moment and you judged that coworker who did not reply to your email, God forgave you. And, it, and when we live in the grace of the forgiveness of Christ, that he has forgiven us of all of our sins. It empowers us to forgive others. 
Let me give you real briefly though, because I think a lot of times there's some, there's some, a lack of clarity around forgiveness, what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not, number one, forgetfulness. In fact, I don't think that's helpful to forget because I think it's important that we understand that this is part of the history of a relationship, but it doesn't mean we'll get to this and I don't hold it over them, but I don't forget about it. Number two, it's not condemnation. We don't condone it or brush it under the rug. Here's how I've heard people do that. Maybe it was your mother's emotional absence when you were young, that there was a fence. And, and I've heard people say, well, you know what? My mom didn't know any better. What you're doing is condoning it. You're brushing it under the rug. Or you know what? My spouse has a lot on his shoulders and that's why he, he said those hurtful words. Here, listen, a mentor once told me this. said, Jeremy, you can never fully forgive someone until you appropriated blame. Until we say they were wrong. And regardless of what someone's carrying, I teach my kids this. It doesn't give us a right to offend people. We don't just say, hey, well, because I'm having a bad day, just take it. No, no, no. So we, gotta, we don't condone it. And then listen, number three is forgiveness is not reconciliation. Now, if it's possible to reconcile, we should. If the person who offended you has repented, it is God's best for there to be reconciliation. If the offense is not too severe, because sometimes the offenses are so severe and significant, there's just no way to, to, and that's okay. They're not the same thing. Here's what forgiveness is. Number one, forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. You may never feel like forgiving that person. Number two, forgiveness is releasing offense. You're not condoning it. You're not forgetting it, but you are no longer holding it against them. And then lastly is forgiveness is beneficial. Harvard Health in 2021 found forgiveness is associated with lower levels of depression, anxiety, and higher self-esteem and greater life satisfaction. It is for your benefit. It's for your benefit. Let me just say one last thing. I'll move to point three in closing. Is that if we really think about it, and I'm really saying this really in love because I've been here. So I'm not saying as somebody who has conquered this. I'm, I'm a work in progress. But when we are unwilling to forgive someone else, it is perhaps one of the most prideful things that we could ever do. Yes. Because God has forgiven you of so much. Yes. And think about this. A lot of times we are offended at somebody and they don't even know. You been there? They're like, hey, why are you acting so different? Nothing. <laughs> why, are you, why, are you, why are you mean mugging me right now? <laughs> no reason. <laughs> hey, on a side note, can we be loving and gracious enough to have conversations with the person who offended us? The Bible says when actually you go sideways to other people, it's called gossip, which is a sin. Go to God. It's getting real quiet in this church and go to that person Amen. and you say, Hey, when you said this, it hurt me and let them know and be a loving and gracious adult and, and give them the opportunity to repent. Is that okay? Amen. So tomorrow morning you can stop mean mugging that coworker. <laughs> and when you go home, stop mean mugging your spouse Jesus. and have a conversation. All right. Number three, number three, my last one, is then we have to remember my God-given purpose. So he remind, she wrote, the, the, the angel reminded Hagar, he says, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. He, he reminds her of the promise of God. He reminds her of the purpose. Again, as I said earlier, when you are running from pain, it will more than likely lead you running away from your purpose. Rarely running away from pain with offense and bitterness will put you in the center of the will of God. <laughs> Quite the opposite. But as she, as, as Hagar allowed God to heal her and uproot bitterness, as she returns to Sarah and she releases in forgiveness, she gives birth to Ishmael. 
which is part of her purpose. And you, if you know the scripture, a lot happens with Ishmael. And the promise that was given to Abraham is now given to, to Hagar and to Ishmael. You know, here in the D.C. area, I don't know where you're watching online, but we are about a few weeks to a month away from what I like to affectionately call devil's dust season. <laughs> pollen. <laughs> you know pollen is from hell, okay? I know it falls from the trees, but I think that it's, it's, not, it's not right. It's not right. Like yellow powder. If you're new to this area, get ready. Your eyes will itch. Your nose will stuff. You're like, oh, do I have the flu? No, just all this yellow stuff. Your car looks like Big Bird. <laughs> Here's a word for our pollen. It doesn't like wipe off your car easily. Like you do windshield wiper fluid and it smears it. So you're driving and you're like, I can't see. Like, it's terrible. It's terrible. The pollen blurs your vision. And watch this. If you, if you remain offended... The pain of offense will blur your vision. Because in that moment, she wasn't thinking about Ishmael. She wasn't thinking about her purpose. She was running from pain. And listen, if you're running from the pain of that last relationship, you aren't thinking about what God's called you to in a relationship. If you're running from the pain of that last career, you're not thinking about what God's actually called you to for your career. Ephesians 1.18, this is a message translation. It's a paraphrase. Paul says this, I ask the God of our master, Jesus Christ, God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing him personally. That your eyes focused and clear so you can see exactly what he is calling you to do. I love that. That God will open your eyes so you can see what he's calling you to. Hey, listen, when you allow God to heal your heart of the offense and the pain of your life, when you release in forgiveness, you begin to allow God once again to open your eyes, to no longer live a life running from pain, but running towards purpose. In fact, Jeremiah 29, uh, 29, 11, many of you, maybe you grew up and you saw this framed in your grandma's house <laughs> or that Christian bookstore on a paperweight. Um, and it says, and a lot of times we, we read the scripture, but we don't have the context. So the context is the Lord tells this to a people who have been offended because they were in exile. They were taken from their home. I'd be offended if it took me from my home. And God tells them this, for I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And plans to give you a hope and a future. God says, listen, don't let the pain of this moment distract you from the purpose and the plan that I have for you. And I'm here to declare this morning that for some of you is that once again, you need to pick up again the plan that God has for your life. That you need to remember the call that God has for you. Maybe you've been living in the pain of that relationship, but you need to remember what God's called you to in that marriage. What God's called you to in your career what God's called you to in writing that book, in launching that business, in raising those kids, in living in this area. Don't allow the pain of offense to blur your vision, but rather take hold of the purpose that God has for you because his plans are to prosper you. His plans are to give you a hope and a future. And your past and your pain will not define you in Jesus' name, but you have to allow God to heal your heart. You then have to release offense so that you can walk in your purpose. Let me pray with you, church. Bow your heads.